Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Matt Swartz. I'm talking after Pete Palmer, which is pretty cool. And uh, exciting. I'm going to talk about knowledge and evolution in the free agent market. So what motivated me to do some of this research is uh, back earlier in the decade, around 2011, 2012, I looked at the free agent market in a lot of detail, specifically looking for certain kinds of players that were underpaid or overpaid and found that certain types of players, certain categories of players, were consistently over underpaid using that sort of framework. The thing is that that's economics. Economics is social science. Social sciences are different than hard sciences. If you study launch angle or exit velocity, those type of things are you know, persistent. They're going to exist whether they're supposed to, you know, whether the hitter knows they're true or not. So if you could take a um, <laughs> You could, take, you could take like a 70 mile an hour, 10 degree launch angle, and you could find that, uh, you know, that's not gonna be a home run. Nothing the hitter or pitcher does is gonna make that a, a home run. But you could have a situation where teams are aware that say good base runners are underpaid and they're gonna end up bidding up their price. That's actually what I'm gonna show you is what has happened considerably over time. So, um, you know, as, as teams have gotten smarter, this happened. A lot of this research I did around 2011, 2012. So from, I'm kind of just going to split things up into the 2006 to 2011 pre-period and the 2012 to 2016 post-period and see if teams have gotten smarter over time. And in a lot of cases, they have. Um, that said, I'm not going to talk about the 2017, because I don't have that data as I was putting this together, and I'm not going to talk about the 2018 <laughs> free agent market, which is obviously something I'm expecting to come up in the Q&A. Um, but, you know, bring it. Definitely would be excited to, to answer those questions. Um, but first I want to kind of talk about the framework of this. So I'm going to talk about why I use the dollar per war analysis. So um, dollar per war is as defined basically the average cost of acquiring one win above replacement on the free agent market. Um, that includes, as I define it, draft pick compensation and everything else. It's not just dollars. It's also looking at all free agents. So that's not literally players that reach the free agent market. It's everybody with six years of service time. That's important because players sign in advance of reaching free agency uh, with kind of an understanding that there's going to be a certain price out there. So um, I kind of use all contracts with an understanding teams are, you know, players are going to sign kind of guessing what the free agent market's going to look like, but that's, you think about this year's free agent market, that's not actually that surprising that people miss on that, right? Because people signed in December not realizing what the free agent market was going to look like in March. So everybody's kind of sign, signing on this. And why this is important is basically the following. Once you get an average dollar per war. You can use that as a baseline to look at anything else. If you're going to trade for a player, you want to think about what's the kind of production, what, what that production would cost on the free agent market going forward. If you're going to exchange money in a transaction, you're going to think about well, what could I have bought with that. If you want to think about how your trade partner thinks about things, you want to think about putting it all in that kind of thing too. If you want to look at the market value of a player even as an alternative, I'm not going to make this move, I'm going to trade him in a year, what's he going to be worth? It gives you a common currency to look at these things. And what it really does is it kind of gives you a baseline. And that baseline, once we have the average dollar per war in a given year, it lets you look at which guys are overvalued or undervalued on a dollar per war framework using that type of thing. Some of that is that teams maybe weren't aware of all this stuff yet, right? Some of it is that teams weren't necessarily um, as privy to you know, the fact that you could get a lot off of good base runners. Um, but some of it is market dynamics and amount of competition that goes in to certain types of players. And I'll give you a really good example of where the dollar per war differ differences actually persist between players even as teams get smarter for that reason. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk about some of the primary results from some of my earlier work. Um, this isn't everything. It's definitely probably the best examples of things in the stuff that I thought would be most interesting to revisit. The first of which is that, in total, re-signed players cost less per war than newly signed players. They're kind of outproducing them, at least from 2006 to 11 when I was looking at these things. On, you know, they're outproducing them on a per dollar basis. Um, that was a shocking, very controversial Got a lot of uh, questions on that analysis when I published it online at the time, and with good reason, because it really changes the way we think about the free agent market. You can't just look at a player's performance in isolation. You have to think about why he got 
to be an unsigned free agent in the first place. That's a big change. And that was certainly something that required a lot of proof. And I'll talk about that in a lot more detail in just a second. Another thing I found is that glove first positions tend to cost less per war or outproduce versus bat first positions. Also found that relief pitchers, and this probably doesn't surprise a ton of people in this room, but that relief pitchers uh, cost a lot more per war underproduced than hitters and starting pitchers. Found, as I mentioned, good base runners tend to outproduce average and bad base runners. They cost less per war, and pitchers with strong peripherals relative to their ERAs tend to outproduce them. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is that first one. It's definitely, you know, what I consider my proudest, biggest finding is that re-signed players outproduce newly signed players. And a lot of people wondered if this was sample size. It was not. There was a lot of different ways that I split this, and this clearly was true regardless of how you looked at it. Whether you looked at two-year deals, three-year deals, four-year deals, five-plus-year deals, consistently, the dollar poor was lower for re-signed guys than newly signed guys. It was true for hitters. It was especially true for pitchers, both starting pitchers and relief pitchers. This was, this was an extremely ro robust kind of finding, and eventually I think I persuaded a lot of people about just how strong that was. It also, by the way, wasn't just true about dollars per war, because people ask, well, what if it's hometown discounts? So I stripped out the guys that signed more than a year in advance, saying maybe those are the hometown discount guys, or at least the guys that are taking a, a risk-averse deal. It wasn't, that still showed a big dollar per war difference. Guys that re-sign cost less than guys that sign with new teams. Uh, this happened when you looked at projections, too. The guys that signed with new teams tended to underperform their projections. The guys that signed with their old teams tend to outproduce their projections. <laughs> Worked with traded players. Traded players tended to underproduce their projections. Traded prospects. The, the number of great prospects that were ranked at similar levels that actually produced as much as other guys of similar rankings after trade, not that many of them. Teams know their own players. And a lot of people thought maybe it was the act of changing teams, but as it kind of aggregates over time, it was clearly more than that. But let's think about what happens when someone publishes something like that. Let's talk about what happens when, and quite frankly, I'm not the only one that discovered this. There's definitely a lot of teams that were kind of starting to realize at the same time. What happens? Well, teams start to think about, somebody gets to the free agent market, you're going to start wondering why they're there. Maybe they're not going to be worth as much as they seem to at initial glance. Not only that, you're going to make a certain decision about your own players. You know that you don't necessarily get as much production as you thought when you get to the free agent market. You're not just going to re-sign the guys that want hometown discounts. You're going to re-sign anybody you got a good feeling about because you're nervous about the free agent market. Agents are going to know this. Players are going to know this, or at least through their agencies, they're going to start demanding higher salaries. The very fact that this knowledge is out there, the very fact that teams are start, had started to realize this, led to a situation where Potentially, you might see the price on re-signed players go up. Over time, you might not see that. That's what's happened. The re-signed players, I call it other people's players, it's OPP, kind of naughty by nature thing. I had a little fun when I published that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, I think it's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, t premium of 20% from 2006 to 11. It's fallen by more than half. And remember, this was stripping out the guys that signed well in advance. You can kind of, you know, you see this, but you see this regardless of whether you strip those guys out or not. You see this tendency that teams kind of bid up their own players. You know, players knew as their teams were trying to resign, they shouldn't just take giant discounts. And it led to this. Now, one of the more strong findings that I had with this is that this was particularly true with pitchers. When I talk about like players beating their projections, you really saw pitchers stayed healthy and aged slower if they re-signed with their own teams. That was something that was clearly true. And if you look at what happened, the OPP premium on pitchers from 2006 to 11 was plus 29%. It actually shot negative as teams started correcting first. Now, some of this is overcorrecting. Some of this is, frankly, you know, there's 117 player seasons in the 66 pitchers. One of those pitchers is Matt Cain. Another one's Tim Lincecum. There's a few of these big outliers that drive up that dollar per war on re-signed players to you know, over 11 million from 2012 to 16. So there's some element of outlier that certainly led to this. But you see teams being careful and going after uh, re-signing their own pitchers, bidding up their prices, and kind of eroding this difference that existed before. That doesn't mean that every difference, it's going to push every kind of player towards the average dollar per war. In fact, I, I think that that's not going to happen in certain cases, and that certainly doesn't seem to happen when we look at positional dollar per war. How much dollar per war do people get at different positions? And these, this, these differences have mostly persisted. So I, I've put the color coding up there. The, um, 
defense first positions, catcher second, third short. I'll tell you why I define them that way in a second. Those guys cost a lot less per war in the pre-period and the post-period. Even as teams got smarter about positions, they still cost less than what I'm defining as the bat first positions or the offense first, uh, first base outfield and DH. Now, probably the first thing that jumps to me was mine. Center fielders certainly seem like, you know, good gloves. Why am I calling them offense first or, or bat first? And the reason is really an important distinction. There's kind of two theories about why these differences could exist. There's one is teams don't get it. They don't realize that second baseman and first baseman, uh, you should have a different baseline. That's one theory. I think that that's not true. I think that the best evidence now is that what causes the difference here is the fact that the free agent market isn't going to the grocery store. It's an auction. The prices adjust as people bid more on these kind of players. The thing about a center fielder, and the reason I've defined a center fielder as a bat first position is that if you have a great center fielder and a great center fielder comes on the free agent market and you have money to spend, you're probably going to try to take a look at him. You probably could go after him because you can move that center fielder over, right? Or if you have a good left fielder and a good you know, left fielder comes available, one of those guys could play first base. Somebody could move to DH. You sign the bat first and you find a spot for them in the lineup. And if they're a good fielder, great, you got somebody great in the corner. But let's say you have a good catcher. Let's say you have Buster Posey. Are the Giants really gonna be bidding for free agent catchers? Probably not, right? Because they're not gonna replace that guy. They might replace, if you have a good center fielder, you might try to replace that, but a good, a good catcher, you're not necessarily gonna bid. And the fewer bidders that you have in an auction, the less likely you're gonna get a bidding war going and driving those prices up. The same is true second base, third base, and shortstop. You're not just gonna sign another sh shortstop and necessarily try to have a, a great guy at second or third because they lose some of their value. Um, that doesn't happen as much in the outfield, first base, or DH, and that's why these differences have kind of persisted. So if you look at these kind of categories, the defense first and the offense first positions, you see that the cost, the discount that you get sort of, if you think about it that way, on the defense first positions. And the top graph is fan graphs, where I'll talk about that first, though. I'll differentiate it with baseball reference in a second. Um, you see discount 25% kind of before and after. The offense first actually even goes up a little, but you know, 14 to, to 28%. Um, so that's kind of still, you know, those differences are still kind of persisting. Now here's the thing, look at relievers, though. And I got that in red there, because it's important. We know because we've been talking about this for forever, that relievers tend to get overvalued sometimes in the free agent market. But teams have started to realize that too, started to put their money more towards other positions, and you see not that much salary growth for relievers. Now, if you use the fan graphs definition, which has a much higher replacement level and therefore much less war going, a much higher replacement level for relievers, lower for starters, you're gonna end up with a lot less war going to relief pitchers, you get pretty high numbers there. But using that number, you see the dollar per war go down from twice as much as other free agents to 68% more. Um, if you use the baseball reference definition, relievers aren't even overpaid anymore. Their dollar per war is now only 3% higher than average as opposed to, to 18 before. So the, it's not that team, the positional differences are bound to persist if they're due to team, something that teams could be smart about. It has to do with the fact that there's something that would lead to an auction. Now, there's also um, other types of situations where certain kinds of players were overpaid. So, for instance, base running, as I mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, good base runners historically have not been paid quite as much per war. You see that gap closing. Now, if you remember some of the early iterations of war, they didn't have base running in there. Something people knew was important, didn't necessarily quantify as well, maybe didn't start concentrating those kind of things in how they bid on free agents. You had sort of, uh, you know, this discount that showed up how much they cost per war. And I note I've split offense and defense first positions based on on this slide, that certainly seems important to do. Make sure we don't mix that up. Um, but you see that the price of good base runners has gone up. People have bid up good base runners knowing that they're underpaid. The very existence, the very existence of the knowledge makes the, the science stop being true. That's what happens with social science sometimes. Um, this also happens not just with base running, but starting pitcher peripherals. So obviously teams got smarter over time about realizing that a guy who had good peripherals, so good you know, walk strikeouts, home runs with a bad ERA maybe was gonna get better or vice versa if, if his peripherals be lighted. But it didn't end up with uh, you know, equalizing the price between pitchers appropriately. Guys that had you know, high ERAs or low ERAs despite uh, you know, high FIPS, they tended to get a lot of money in free agency anyway from 2006 to 11. And that difference really has, has gone down. Uh, and it hasn't disappeared entirely. And, you know, some, you know, once you get 10%, you know, there's only so many players could be thing. But you see, in the context of everything else, yet another indication that as teams get smarter, that kind of closes the gap 
in dollar per war between these things. So if you kind of put these together, you kind of see things showing up in, in, in various categories. You, you see some differences in dollar per war across players is probably just that teams weren't really aware. As teams got smarter, they started you know, bidding up the, high dollar, the, the low dollar per war guys, being a little more careful and not bidding up the high dollar per war guys as much. Certainly teams have bid up the price of uh, you know, their own players rather than re-signing, uh, rather than signing players from other teams. And you see the gap in reliever value closing. You see the statistical profiles clearly, like y there's not some low-hanging fruit, like you can imagine in Moneyball, like nobody else was going after on base percentage. That part's not happening. But you do see, and this is a really good example of where dollar per war differences could be expected to persist in the future in an era of smart teams, is where is there less likely to be a bidding war? And, you know, glove first positions, those catchers, second baseman, third baseman, and shortstops, primary opportunity of that. So this gives you know certain actionable information for teams. One, just even if everybody was actually paid an equal dollar per war projection and we get rid of those competitive auction type differences, uh, it gives an opportunity cost. Let's you think about whether you make a trade, whether someone else is likely to make a trade, anything like else in the context of that. Um, also, you know, the pendulum has not swung all the way around to the other direction on re-signing your own guys. Teams should continue to try to re-sign their own players if they get a good feeling about them and ask themselves the question when somebody reaches the free agent market, should this guy, is there some reason, is, you know, is this a type of, this guy fill a need for his old team? Was he willing to sign with his old team and he's not there? Is there something they know about him? Teams have started doing this clearly and probably good indication that they, you know, they should really ought to continue that. The implications of the positional differences are really important because it lets you make decisions in advance of knowing that. So if you consider a situation where you're really on the fence between a couple of draft picks, you got like an infielder and an outfielder, and maybe you think that the infielder is likely to be a little bit better, you got to consider the fact that if you end up short and needing to supplement with free agency in the outfield, and you always need to supplement in free agency, there's no teams that can do this without free agency a little bit. Um, you might actually, in that case, want to draft the outfielder, even if you have him projected for a little bit less, because you know that you're more likely to end up in a bidding war in the future if, if that happens. Um, also, you know, teams got to accept that, you know, you need to be innovative. You're not just going to assign guys with low FIPS or good base runners or stuff like that. Um, but really, all of this means that finding market inefficiencies would be harder. Um, so obviously, looking for guys where there's like, less likely to be a bidding war is a smart thing. Um, I hear you can get Mike Moustakas that way. Um, but in general, you need to think about why, what happens when, when a player reaches free agency and you outbid 29 other teams. Is that because you see something that other teams do not, or is that because you're missing something that other teams are seeing? There's something about auctions which is called the winner's curse, which is that if a uh, you know, number of people are bidding on something, in an auction. The one that wins is the one that valued it the highest. Now, if they're bidding on something that has personal value, jewelry or something like that, um, in that type of situation, the person who wins is probably just the person who liked the jewelry the best. But if it's a 280 hitter that some teams see as a 290 hitter, some teams see, see as a 270 hitter, um, but most teams see as a 280 hitter, the one that's going to win the auction is the one that thinks he's a 290 hitter in all likelihood. The question is, is that because you see something that other teams didn't? Or is that because 29 other teams saw something that made them stop bidding and you kept, kept going? You need to think about not how much a guy is worth in a vacuum, but how much a guy is worth conditional on the knowledge that there are 29 teams that don't think he's worth that much. All right, that's my uh, presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions in general. Yes, uh, to me it seems there is a, an obvious, uh, so not so obvious, but to me there's a, 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 the, the, an inefficiency in that if you were to find a, a team full of hitters that could hit to the opposite field with shifting, do you, did you, have you thought about that, that that may be a market inefficiency? Because with all the shifting and everything and everyone going for uh, you know, on a uh, slugging percentage, it seems to me that that would be something would be worth uh, studying. So there's kind of, so it sounds like one question, it's sort of two. Are there guys that you think could beat the shift, guys that you know would be good bunters that don't bunt a lot that maybe 29 other teams don't think are gonna bunt a lot? I mean, maybe there is, or maybe teams are looking at that already, I don't know. The question of are there guys that tend to beat the shift, well, unless those aren't showing up in teams' internal projections, probably in that case, uh, it's going to show up already. But yeah, that could be, you know, but you need to stay ahead. And that's sort of along those lines of thinking is the way you do. You need to think about the kind of things that 29 other teams aren't thinking of. 
I'm not, I'm not just saying bunting. I'm just saying when you see I'm the ship example, just yeah. hitting to the opposite field is not valued. And I think if a team starts to scout these type of players uh, and sign them, they could probably do it at a, a low price. True. And if that is true if it's not showing up in projections already, basically, I would say. But yeah, I see your point on that. Uh, what would you attribute to the large spike in uh, first baseman from the two five-year segments? That one looked like it had a massive spike compared to any other position. Um, so there's this team, the Angels. They signed this. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it is small sample. There's a couple of really ugly first baseman contracts in there. <laughs> hey. Um, well. Oh. Nobody else asked, so uh, what, what's your hot take on this uh, off-season's free agent market? All right, yeah, no, I was kind of expecting that, that question. Thank you for asking it. So, all right, um, a lot of people have attributed, and, uh, you know, you see, you know, a lot of the, the panels so far have kind of talked about, what if all this trying to get a smart dollar per war is actually leading to lower prices on the free agent market? So I'll tell you why I don't think that's likely to be true. And one of it is that teams have been getting smart over time. So this isn't like teams suddenly got smart this winter, but they were idiots last winter. So one thing, when you see a sudden effect, like what happened this offseason, you probably need some kind of sudden cause to describe that sudden effect. The other thing, um, and a lot of people kind of wonder if, you know, all these teams going for low dollar per war guys is leading to low dollar per war costs. And I think a lot of that has to do with that they're used to shopping for groceries where they're price takers rather than participating in an auction. Because when you have uh, you know, studies that show these guys are high dollar per war guys, these guys are low dollar per war guys, there's going to be pressure in both directions. The high dollar per war guys, uh, maybe teams are going to be more reluctant to spend those kind of prices and drive them down towards the average. But you're also going to see things on the other side. Those low dollar per war guys, teams are going to recognize those guys tend to be good values and bid their values up. All right. But in practice, how many teams would I need to convince that a high dollar per war guy was costing too much per war before it actually prevented a bidding war from happening? 29. Because if there's two out of 30 teams that think that that guy is actually worth that really high dollar per war number, they're going to bid up his price. It's kind of hard for smart thinking to really work unless it's convincing everybody. But you only need to convince two teams that somebody is a low dollar per war guy before they start bidding up his price towards the average dollar per war. So I think of anything, this kind of framework doesn't push the dollar per war uh, downward. If anything, it pushes it upward. And you know, if you notice a lot of this stuff since done during 2012 to 16, which is a period of relatively high salary growth, doesn't happen. If I want to talk about this year's free agent market, again, sudden effect suggests a sudden cause. What's so different about this year's market? Well, I mean, you know, the, the collective bargaining agreement goes into place, you know, a year ago. So it's the second offseason. Maybe teams didn't get it. That could be another explanation. Um, you know, and I, I guess that's possible. But to me, what seems a little bit more glaring about this offseason is the way that the divisions are projected to shake out. Remember, what makes a free agent valuable is not just his production, but his production in the context of his division and how, mu how much likely he is to lead to a division title and eventually a World Series title. If you look at the projected win totals this year, right now, the preseason, for five of the six divisions, the first place and second place projected team, there's a nine game gap. That's not normal. Go back four years, 24 divisions, only three of them have had a gap like that. You got five like that, that this year. What that means is that you don't have that many divisions that are that competitive. And that means you don't have that many situations where you've got people going for a bidding war. And so you see, especially like third baseman, where if you, there's just no bidding war, you're just not going to drive up the, those, those prices. Not only that, you take those, those, uh, the, the one division where there is, you know, the Yankees and Red Sox are kind of projected close together, both the teams are concerned about the luxury tax. Four of the five other ones are too. And you know, the other one is Cleveland, and that probably doesn't cue the balloons at the Players Association headquarters that like Cleveland has a whole bunch of room to go before they hit the luxury tax, right? So when you put that all, you combine the luxury tax, which is big, and the uncompetitive divisions together, you end up with this situation where I think that there's just really not bidding wars going in a lot of situations where historically there are always at least two teams that go after these guys. So I think that, that's my personal theory about what's been going on this offseason. <laughs> uh, collusion is a big deal if it were true, then obviously that happened, but there's definitely, I think, a good explanation about why that, that wouldn't be needed to explain the suddenness of what's happened. <laughs>